It's such an honor to be here. And listen, the talk of SBC is what is God is doing on this campus. Um, and it's such an honor to be here. And first of all, um, can we just thank the Lord for the leadership of my friend, Dr. Dew, and what God's doing through his leadership and so many others here. So thankful. Thank you, friend, for having me and the invite. And I see so many other friends that are here as well. What an honor it is to worship Jesus with you. In fact, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you got to see me this morning. Why don't you tell them that? All right. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I hope that you do, will you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you have something to write on and write with, if you'll get that out. And this morning, I just want to encourage you. In fact... Um, you may not even hear anything new this morning. Maybe today we'd just be reminded of the calling of God on our life. You know, uh, I believe that we should have a heart that's bent towards spiritual awakening and revival. And a lot of people will ask, well, you know, what is that? I think a lot of times in culture, people think spiritual awakening or revival is uh, a lot of crying and weeping and getting Holy Spirit goosebumps. But really, revival is the people of God awakening to the calling of God on their life. And here's what I know, is that when the people of God will get serious about the calling of God on their life, then guess what happens? Communities benefit. Cities benefit. Schools benefit. People benefit when the people of God will get serious about the calling of God on their life. So today, maybe it's just a reminder and encouragement of what we get to do as new creation in Christ so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17, I'll be reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. And if you're in the sermon titles, the title of today's message is this, God saves you to send you. God saves you to send you. As you're getting to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you know, a lot of times when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we'll talk about how the gospel saves us from things, right? How the gospel saves us from sin, how the gospel saves us from death. How the gospel saves us from destruction. How the gospel saves us from hell. But we also need to realize the gospel also saves us to some things. Saves us to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Saves us to a family of God. Saves us to the church. And also saves us to a mission. To know Jesus and to make Jesus known. And Paul's going to remind us of that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Now look at 517. 517, you've probably seen it on the back of t-shirts before on a Christian coffee mug. Here's what Paul says. He says, therefore, if anyone, and you're going to help me with this this morning, so turn to your neighbor and say, that means you. Tell them that. All right, we're going to be interactive this morning. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Anybody happy about that? The old has passed away and see the new has come. See, Paul reminds them of their identity, that their identity now is being a new creation. We were sinners separated from God. Now we are saints who are one with God because of the work of Jesus Christ, so new creation. We were lost, met Jesus, now we're found, new creation. We were orphans because of sin, met Jesus, now we're children of the Most High God, new creation. We were dead, met Jesus, now we're alive, new creation. That's good news. And that happens right now. And so I love how Paul constantly in his writings will remind people of the gospel. And he'll say, because of the gospel, because of your identity, now do these things. See, the gospel will change who we are, but it will also change what we do. See, the gospel will change your identity, then it will change your activity. It means this, friends, no matter how long we've been following Jesus... No matter how many degrees we have or what our experience is, we never mature past the gospel. We mature in the gospel. And I love seeing so many young people in here as well. You know, young people, you know, you're told all the time you're the future of the church, right? Have you ever heard that? You're the future of the church. You're the future of the church. And I know what we mean by that. Future leaders, pastors, influencers, sure. But theologically speaking, we need to be reminded, according to the New Testament, if you've been bought by the blood of Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit of God, you are not the future of the church. You are the church right now. In fact, theologically speaking, the future of the church are spiritually lost people who have yet to be reached with the gospel. Because the moment they get reached with the gospel, they become the church right now too. And so in light of that, as new creations in Christ, that means this, we can no longer go through life staring at our own belly button. 
We have to look up and notice the lostness around us and the hurt around us and the suffering around us. And so Paul's going to give us three things here today. And I want to encourage you to write these down. If you're a new creation in Christ, God's given you three things. And for most of us, this is going to be a reminder. But a reminder that will drive us to obedience. He's given us three things. So as a new creation in Christ, number one, look at verse 18. It says, everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the, what does your Bible say? What does the word of God say? The what? Ministry of reconciliation. Number one, God's given you a ministry. He's given you a ministry. If you're a new creation, he's given you a ministry. And I think a lot of times we'll think of ministry means, oh, a church staff position. Now, we need to be reminded of this. Before the Lord ever gives you any kind of title or position or put your name on an office door or on a picture on a website or some kind of promo card, he just, fought, he just called you to follow his son Jesus. And we'll always be at our best when we are serving and leading and making disciples out of the overflow of our own worship of Jesus. But it begs the question, who did he give the ministry of reconciliation to? Well, according to context here, anyone who is a new creation. That means this. If you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit of God, you are called to the ministry of reconciliation. In fact, I always love to do this, especially with young people, as a visual reminder. So I'm going to encourage you to do this with me as a physical exercise this morning. Would you put both your feet on the floor? Would you just humor me with this? All right, would you put both your feet on the floor? All right, would you look down at your two feet? All right, and you go, well, what's my mission field? What's my ministry of reconciliation? Where am I called to live on mission? All right, you see that floor between your two feet? That floor or that ground between your two feet at any point of the day, that's your ministry of reconciliation. It changes the way we see everything. School is a place to know Jesus and make Jesus known. How many of you have a job already? You work, that's a mission field. How many of you work with people that do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior? If you'd be honest, maybe you go, I don't like my job. You may not like your job, but love your mission field. God has sent you there to know him and to make him known. Uh, Your neighborhood, the nations, everywhere our feet touches, that ground between our two feet is our mission field. That's where we're called to live on mission. Your family, God has sent you there to know him and to make him known. How many of you have family members that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Uh, I do. uh, In fact, most of my family are not believers but they think they are because they live in Texas. You know what I mean? (laughs) They're like, God, country, and guns, but lost and don't know Jesus. And can we be honest? Sometimes in family, the most difficult to minister to sometimes, I can talk to a complete stranger about Jesus, but when I'm talking to my cousin Butch, yes, I have a cousin named Butch because I live in Texas. (laughs) I stumble all over myself, right? Because think about it, every family has at least one weirdo, doesn't it? The weird cousin, the weird uncle. Right now, I want you to think of who the one weirdo is in your family. If you can't think of anybody. (laughs) It's you. You're the one, right? But that's our ministry. That's our mission field. Everywhere we go. In fact, for my family, it's my Aunt Corey. I love my Aunt Corey. um, But she's the weird one in my family. and, And she knows it. And I love to give her a hard time. True story. My whole life... As long as I can remember, my Aunt Corey, every single day, wears a turtle brooch on her back shoulder. She has hundreds of these little turtle brooches that she wears on her back shoulder every day. She has different colors to match her outfit. And she'll totally play into the weirdness. She'll say, no matter how slow I go, I'm always in front of my turtle. It's weird. (laughs) That's our ministry. That's our mission field. God has called us. So number one, if you're a new creation, you have a ministry. God's called you to know him, to make him known in the neighborhoods to the nations. Number two, if you're a new creation in Christ, as a reminder, look at verse 19. That is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Anybody happy about that? And has committed, look at this, the message of reconciliation in the CSB. So number two, you have a message. If you are a new creation in Christ, you have a ministry But God's also giving you a message to take into that ministry. And what is that message? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of Jesus. And I have good news for you, friends. The same gospel that has worked for 2,000 years still works today. In fact, 
the pandemic, I tell people this, especially with young people, the pandemic did not create new problems. It just poured gasoline on the problems that were already there. So now you have a whole generation of young adults and college students and teenagers that are coming to the end of themselves at a much earlier age. They realize the world is broken. They realize they're broken. That's why I think suicide rates are up and depression rates are up and anxiety rates are up. They're looking for hope. They're looking for answers. They're looking for truth. And as the church, that's where we get to slide in and say, listen, hope has a name. Truth has a name. The answer has a name. It's the name above every name. It's the name Jesus Christ. See, outside the walls of this seminary is a hopeless world, a joyless world, a world full of death, and a world full of conflict. And here's what we know. A hopeless world needs hope. A joyless world needs joy. A world full of death needs life. And a world full of conflict needs peace. And we know this. Here is the message of reconciliation. Here is the good news of Jesus. Is that hope has a name. Joy has a name. Peace has a name. Life has a name. And that name is Jesus. Somebody once said it like this. God's plan A of reaching the world with the good news of the gospel is the church. And there's no backup plan. Meaning this, friends, we have something for this community that Walmart can't provide. The life-saving message of Jesus Christ. But isn't it sad that a lot of Christians are better at sharing the flu with people than they are sharing the gospel with people? And we get this message. How many of you are so glad someone shared the gospel of Jesus with you? Listen, we can't be selfish with it anymore, friends. We get to do this. We have the message of hope. That God created us, sin separated us, sin's a big problem, but there's a bigger solution named Jesus. That 2,000 years ago, the Son of God who has always existed took a mission trip from heaven to earth and became a man to die as a man for mankind, but never stopped being God. Fully God, fully man. He lived a perfect sin-free life that you and I could not live. Think about it. Everything he did was good and awesome. Caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the handicapped to get up and walk. He fed over 5,000 people with two fish sandwiches. Subway has nothing on that, brother. Amen. (laughs) And then he took our place on the cross. We deserve to be there. We are sinners. He is sinless. We are messed up. He is perfect. Yet he took our place as the perfect sacrifice of sin, as the perfect substitute in our place. And he died there. And they took his lifeless body off the cross and put it in a borrowed grave. Now, why did they put the body of Jesus in a borrowed grave? Now, listen, New Orleans Seminary, this next part should make us yell so loudly the whole city hears us. You know why they put the body of Jesus in a borrowed grave? Because he wasn't going to need it long, baby. Because three days later, our Jesus busted out of the grave, showing that God the Father had accepted God the Son's sacrifice on our behalf. Jesus lives. The tomb is empty. And because the tomb is empty, we can be full of the life of Christ. Jesus today sits on the throne as King of kings and Lord of lords. Because the tomb is empty, we can be full of the life of Jesus. And we get to tell the world that. We get to tell the world that. So number one, he's given you a ministry. Number two, he's given you a message. Number three, number last, he's given you a means. Now, don't be mean. He's given you a means, which is himself, the Holy Spirit of God. Look at verse 20. It says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I love verse 20. Verse 20 has become one of my favorite verses. So the charge on our life is that we've been given this ministry. We've been given a message, the gospel to take into our ministries. And in that... We are ambassadors for Christ. Now, we know an ambassador is someone who lives in a foreign land sent by their king or who lives in a, in a country sent by their king to live in a foreign land. And while they're there in a foreign land, their main job is to represent their home king and home country. Yes, we are citizens of the United States or citizens of another country. But if we've been bought by the blood of Jesus and have the Holy Spirit of God, our primary citizenship is the kingdom of God. And our primary leader is the leader of all leaders, King Jesus. And while we're here, our main job is to represent him in the kingdom of heaven. And we understand that. So we're ambassadors for Christ. And since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. So 
when we're in our ministries, taking our message, we're basically pleading with people. We're begging people to be reconciled with God. We're begging people to know Jesus. We're begging people to experience eternal life. And I used to talk about this verse all the time and talk about being ambassadors and pleading with people, but I would leave off the middle part, which I believe is the power of the verse, the crux of the verse, when Paul says this. He says, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. There it is, since God is making his appeal through us. Since God is making his appeal through us. So according to this verse, who's doing all the work? God is. Like we have the Holy Spirit of God. We have the power. We have the greatest power there is. We don't worship some weak God. We worship an all-powerful God, and he lives inside of us. So it looks like this. We're called to the ministry of reconciliation, but God's going to do the ministry through us. We're called to proclaim a message, but God's going to proclaim the message through us. He's doing the work. He's our power. Therefore, he is our means. We have a means. It's the Holy Spirit of God himself. And sometimes we hear messages like this go, yeah, we got to go win the world. And if we go out by our own power, we're going to fall on our face. It's kind of like this, all right? Any movie fans? Any movie fans in close? All right, I am as well. Anybody seen this movie? Can we throw this up? Anybody seen this movie here? Yeah. All right, so what movie is this? Lion King. If you've ever seen the movie Lion King, real quick, at the beginning, you have the dad line, Mufasa. He's with his son, Simba. They're on top of Pride Rock, and Mufasa, almost with the voice of God, looks at Simba and he says, Simba, everywhere the light touches our kingdom, but out there in the land of the shadows, don't go there. That's the enemy's territory. Because there was an enemy named Scar, and Scar had these little workers, the three hyenas. And so he says, Simba, stay right here where it's safe. Stay right here where it's known. Don't go to the enemy's territory. But here's a problem. Simba had a little girly friend. Do you remember this? And her name's Nala. And here's kind of my version of how this goes down. And one day Simba goes to Nala and he says, say boo. She's like, what's up, stud muffin? He's like, girl, you want to go to the land of the shadows? She's like, uh-uh, we're not supposed to go there. And he's like, girl, I got you. I'm a cub, stud. And she's like, okay, you're so dreamy. And then they go to the land of the shadows. And then here comes the enemy, the three hyenas, and they start chasing Simba and Nala. Do you remember that? And they're running, falling over elephant bones. They get backed into a corner. Simba says, here's my chance to show off in front of my girlfriend. So he takes his little paw and he scoots Nala behind him and looks at the face of the enemy and he goes, Rawr. do you remember that? <laughs> what did the enemy do? Laughed in his face. So he gathers himself again and he goes, oh. but right before he roars, there was this other roar. There was a roar and the enemy flies backwards and does backwards somersaults. Now, was it Simba who roared if you've seen the movie? No, who was it? Mufasa, the Lion King, and he pounces on the enemy. And he goes, did you know this was my son? And they were like, uh-uh, uh-uh. And the third one goes, uh-huh. Do you remember that? <laughs> All right, here's the point. We have a Lion King. The Bible calls Jesus the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings. But friends, don't miss this, because I think this is where a lot of our churches get it wrong, is that our Lion King does not tell us what Mufasa told Simba. See, Mufasa told Simba, stay right here where it's safe. Stay right here where it's known. See, our Lion King doesn't say that because we also have an enemy. His name is not Scar. His name is Satan. He's out to kill, steal, and destroy. And you know what our enemy is not scared of? Don't miss this. Our enemy is not scared of a bunch of Christians in a holy huddle, soaking up air conditioning, sitting on padded pews, waiting for the rapture bus to swoop down and pick them all up. And in the meantime, they wag their finger at the world going, ah, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. The enemy's not scared of that. In fact, can we just say this? If the world is content going to hell in a handbasket, maybe it's because the church is too content waiting to go to heaven, sitting on pews, doing nothing. But you know what our enemy is terrified of? See, our Lion King doesn't say, hey, stay right here where it's safe. See, our Lion King gives us the great commission at the end of Matthew 28. And what does he say? Does he say, hey, everybody, let's stay. No, what does he say? Go. He says, go into the enemy's territory. Go into the land of the shadows. Go into your ministries. Go into your neighborhoods. Go into your workplaces. Go into your families. Go into the nations. Go. Charge the darkness. But if we hear that and go, yeah, we're going to go, we're going to go, and we go out by our own power, you know what we sound like? Rah. See, he is our means. See, because our great Lion King doesn't go, hey, go, and good luck to you. Hope it works out for you. 
No, no, no. Our great Lion King gives us a great promise at the end of the Great Commission. What does he say? You know, and know that I'm with you, what? Always. All right, I'll close with this. I don't want you to see a grown man cry in the morning, but this gets me. This gets me out of bed every morning. As our great Lion King says this, go into the land of the shadows. Go into the enemy's territory. Go into the darkness. Go into your ministries. Go proclaim a message and know this. I am going with you. And I'm going to roar through you. I'm going to push back darkness through you. I'm going to terrify the enemy through you. I am going with you. Now, I don't know about you, my friends, but I believe this. The enemy is terrified of that. When the people of God realize they have a calling of God and they have the message of God and they go out in the power of God, the enemy is mortified of that. And I don't know about you. I'm not typically a morning person. Sometimes I wake up, instead of saying, good morning, Lord, I say, good Lord, it's morning. But this is a reason to get out of bed every morning. It's because our great Lion King says, I have a mission for you. I have a ministry for you. I have a message. So go and know this. I am going with you. I am your means. So how about we just end like that today? How about we just go out in the power of our great God and be the church who he's called us to be for his name, his fame, and his glory? Because he deserves that. You're dismissed. Thank you for your time. Yeah.